Shadowverse. Greetings, I'm Shad, and welcome to this very cool episode where I get to have a bit of an interview with the talented, the phenomenal Mike S. Miller. Now, if you don't know who Mike is, he is a comic book artist, a great comic book artist. In fact, he's a bit of an industry veteran and pro, and not only that, he is the comic book artist who is doing the principal artwork, which is the pencils and ink, for the graphic novel adaptation of my book, Shadow of the Conqueror. You probably uh, heard me mention that a couple of times. And this is, like, I'm hugely excited about this because the quality of the graphic novel is just amazing. And uh, I really want to take the opportunity to have a chat with Mike to introduce him to you guys, but also talk about some really cool things. Talk about uh, the adaptive process of what we're doing with Shadow of the Conqueror, what it's going to be like, what it, what it has been like so far, but also the kind of new area that the industry is starting to fill and the role that YouTube is and the opportunities that YouTubers have to fill, but also a lot of other things, because when I say Mike is a veteran, he's done some amazing work. He did the uh, graphic novel adaptation for uh, uh, The Hedge Knight, which is a prequel series of A Song of Ice and Fire. Now, if that's sounding familiar, this is Game of Thrones. This is all in the Game of Thrones universe by George R. Mann. And not only that, he just recently let me know that he also did the artwork for Wheel of Time, A New Spring. And I like that he never told me that before. I got the book right here. I love the Wheel of Time. And he, he did the artist for Wheel of Time as well. And he also did some of the pencils for um, the Dragonland series. Like, these are some of my favorite book series. And Mike is the artist behind it all. And he is doing the uh, artwork for Shadow of the Conqueror. So this is phenomenal. And just to show you some of the preview images of the artwork, if you want to see it all, you'll need to get the graphic novel. But anyway, before I ramble too much, here is Mike S. Miller. Introduce Mike. How are you, mate? I'm doing very well, Shad. Thank you for having me on here. It's a pleasure. No, no, it's my pleasure, actually, because uh, it's funny. We're being so formal, but we've been working together for months already. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, the now, seeds were planted about a year ago. Yeah, actually. Do you want to share how that kind of transpired and went about? Yeah, one of my fans, so I have my own YouTube channel, and one of my fans was telling me, and I, I wish I could give him credit, but I don't remember who it was, but <laughs> was telling me that you had uh, the Hedge Knight on your bookshelf. And so I, I checked it out and, I, and I'm like, oh, yeah, he does. And so I reached out to you on Twitter and I'm just like, hey, I hear you like my work. And you're like, yeah. And so uh, 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 a couple of, you know, DMs back and forth. And I, I remember I sent you a link to an uh, impromptu uh, hangout we were doing uh, with, uh, with some of the, the other uh, Game of Thrones related uh, channels, Order of the Green Hand and uh, Quinn's Ideas. And you popped up, and we had a great conversation for about an hour. I brought up the idea of comics, I think, on that stream. I think it was. And, uh, um, it, then we that stream is still available to be watched as well. It's on your channel, isn't it? Yes, yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, you probably have to go to my channel and then just look up Shadowversity, I think. And what's interesting, because I remember you talking to me that like uh, there's a great opportunity in making graphic novels, which is actually something I want to talk on a little bit later about where the uh, the industry is actually moving towards now in terms of the indie scene, because uh, this YouTubing, YouTuber space has huge opportunities. And you were saying, mm. well, with what's happening in the industry, you're in a prime position to actually, you could make some really great graphic novels. And at first, like, this was something I mentioned on the stream, but I'm just paraphrasing, but if you want the full thing, watch the stream. I mentioned that that was on my mind. It's kind of something I always wanted to do. And I was thinking that I had other, would, would produce these other things that were dedicated for, you know, a graphic novel or comic book. But then I, it was in that conversation, I was like, well, no, hang on, I do have a whole book already published. <laughs> that, that something could be done with that. Yeah. And then I kind of went, you know, snowballed from there. Uh, I do want to give people an update because initially the graphic novel has moved forward like, like really, really well. And uh, Mike, you've done all the art and the inking now. Um, yep. And it's like, guys, I'm not kidding when I say it's amazing. Like this artwork is absolutely phenomenal. So I'm, I'm actually really excited for it. We were hoping to do the launch campaign in November, and obviously it's not November anymore. Um, and there's been a, a number of other things. There's a bit of an announcement as related to this. My time has been restricted because my wife is pregnant and we're expecting a child in February, which has been restricted my time. But there's also, also some other things um, that has happened with a graphic novel. And it's basically that I, w I wanted to make sure that we are making the best quality 
graphic novel and result possible, even mm-hmm. in the trailer. And because of that, I've been going out of my way to uh, recruit some of the best talent possible in terms of the, the coloring, the lettering, but also just the trailer for the graphic novel and release. Uh, and because of that, uh, it's required it waiting when certain people are available, causing delays. And so I'm also taking time off in, in December. Sorry, I, I wanted to mention that, couldn't give people an update, but it's still moving. I mean, it's progressing quite well. The colorist is still working on it. Um, yep. And so it just means that more of the graphic novel is going to be completed by the time we launch, which means less waiting from the launch to when we can start fulfillment and printing and all that stuff, which is exciting. Let's wait for you. Uh, but I, I mean, it depends when you have to wait. Anyway, so there's that. Um, sorry for rambling. Uh, I have Mike here for a reason. Uh, for many reasons. <laughs> um, but what's it been like working on Shadow of the Conqueror? Um, because I think one of my fans will be interested in your take on the story, the adaptation process. Uh, any thoughts you have about that? It's been really fun. This is not my first adaptation. Uh, I helped with the adaptation on the Hedge Knight. I I worked on the uh, the black uh, was it the black, red, and white adaptations for Ted Decker. Um, I I did the Meg. I adapted the first uh, third of that, and then I handed it off to a, a, another writer. So adaptation is kind of something I've been doing for years now. And boy, it's uh, you know I don't think I've worked quite as closely with an author since George R. R. Martin. Now, when I did The Hedge Knight, this was long before HBO was a thing in George's life. And so he was he was very intimate with how he wanted The Hedge Knight to be adapted. So I was I was talking to him all the time. And I think you're the uh, the, the second most involved author with any of the adaptations I've done. And it's been really fun because not only are we taking your story the way it is, the canon story, but we are we are opening up parts of it that I don't want to give anything away, but we're opening up parts of it that expanded to create a complete fulfilling story arc in the first book, whereas it's still canon and it's still part of your uh, uh, novel, right? But it's truly an adaptation. It's not just me drawing what you wrote. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And well, that's the interesting thing about the nature of adaptation, because when you're working in a different medium, things have to change. The mechanisms which convey the story can be completely different. Yes, there's a writing element, but as soon as you add that visual element, that changes up things completely. But then there's also the matter of pacing. Pacing is totally Mm -hmm. different. Um, And also length, the amount of room that you have to fit in. Uh, A graphic novel is... uh, When I say it's more difficult to produce, you know, uh, books can take about a year or more to... It it varies, but... um, it costs more money, I can say that, because you have more people working on it and it's a more collaborative process. And so in that sense, it's more difficult, depending on, on what you do with the RN novel, of course. Because of that, look, we we have to, you have to rely on different people, which is, you know, you're relying on me and then we're relying on the colorist and then we're also relying on the letterer. And then at some point we have to, well, we're already talking to the printer, right? And when you're just writing your own book, it's like you and then your editor and then get that to the fans, right? I mean, there's probably a couple other people who have that hands in the pie, but but yeah, this is making comics is it's not as involved as you know making movies where you have to have 500 key grips or whatever it is, but it does. There are layers of responsibility, and uh, you know, so far so good. So far, we're producing. Oh man, the the colors coming in from the colorist on those covers is just fantastic, and uh, and his response time in in making changes really good. So uh, it looks like this is going to be. Quite possibly one of the best things I've ever done in my career. So. See that that that's that's like that's what I was going for. I wanted to, to try and help facilitate one of the best quality graphic novels we can possibly make. I wanted it to feel like this is professional quality, the top that you can get. And uh, and I've already been a fan of your art, right? so so I think you're a great artist. But I also think the work you've been doing on Shadow of the Conqueror is some of the best work you've ever done. Um, and I. I'm saying that genuinely. Um, Thank you. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. And, and you actually reminded the thing that I was going to talk about it because I was trying to describe the interesting things about adaptation where in a book, if you want to describe a scene, sometimes that can take a couple of paragraphs to even a page or more depending mm-hmm. on the complexity of what you're trying to describe. Graphic novel, you can do it in a single panel sometimes or, or a yep. page and you can yep. convey because sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. And yet sometimes it's, it, it's even more difficult to um, show things in a visual format like a graphic novel because you have less room to put in text. And so if you want to uh, 
dive really deeply into someone's emotions and their experience and what they're feeling, a book you can take as much time as you want, constrained mm -hmm. by pacing and what is still engaging the reader. But in a graphic novel, it's completely different because you want things to actually flow fairly well between panels. And if you get stuck on a panel, which is overwhelmed with text and everything like that, it can be difficult. And then there are ways to add more text, but then you need more panels, you need more pages to fit it in nicely. And yeah. it's, it's been a really interesting process to see the uh, the ways that you make a graphic novel and the, the, the things that you need to do to uh, encourage effective storytelling in a, in a visual format like a graphic novel compared to text. And so not only has it been a growing experience, but I've been finding it really, really interesting. And, you know, because you have so much experience of it, you have almost like a sixth sense because there's another side to making a graphic novel, which is really interesting. I know for a kid, I didn't notice this, but that's kind of a good thing. You want it to be seamless. And that is the nature of visual storytelling from panel to panel. Mm -hmm. Like the very structure of the panels is an art uh, about what, kind of images in the scene you're choosing to grab it and to visualize and to use to convey the story what's kind of your process in that because that is that's something that I like I can see you have perfected really well over time and it's almost it's almost like a foreign thing because of course I wouldn't be able to do nearly as good a job like, like for me it's it's a struggle uh obviously I'm doing the the writing on the adaptation as well and I'm trying to stay with your story as much as I can um, the way you have it laid out, but also I want to sort of uh, make sure everything is paced well. And it's this dichotomy between being the writer and being the artist. Whereas when you're the writer of a comic book, um, you have all the certain things you want to play out. And when you're the writer, you have certain key things that you find more exciting to draw or more, more uh, flashy or whatever it is. So as both artist and writer, I kind of struggle through this dichotomy where, where I'm trying to do what's best for both, which I think actually makes for a better uh, graphic novel because, you know, you can tell when when a, an artist is getting a little too loosey goosey and a little too excited about wanting to draw like the big splashy hero thing, which is fun to view as the artist. But to me, it is the story The comic books are the art of storytelling. And so you have to find a balance where you can place these great uh, fun images that, that sort of take precedence on a page. But at the same time, you're not sacrificing the actual storytelling that's going on on each page. I learned way back, I think it was John Byrne who said it, that each page in a comic book should be a story into itself, like beginning, middle, end, you know, and and that's the way I've always tried to approach it. And I really do enjoy getting to be the writer on my own stuff because I'm not I'm not worried about stepping on the toes of someone else. If I'm stepping on the toes of myself as a writer, and then I'm pulling back the reins of myself as an artist to try to have that perfect amalgam uh, of storytelling and flash and and detail and and all this stuff. It's uh, it's yeah. And working on your stuff, you you're giving me such free reign. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's 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 a lot of juggling. It's I'm trying to please you, the audience, myself as a writer, myself as an artist, and god and so <laughs> uh i'm just it's been really exciting it's been a lot of fun and yeah i am pouring my 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 guts into this so i'm glad you uh I'm glad you think this is the best stuff i've ever done because i think some of these pages are are legitimately yeah some of the best stuff <laughs> like we'll, we'll bring up on screen just like a, a preview of one of the splash pages and it's it's utterly amazing like uh, and I, I, I'll avoid spoilers because there's some splash pages that are conveyed to story and stuff. But yeah, I, I, absolutely incredible. Now, on what you were saying about being a balance between the writing and the visual side and stuff, that's something that I was noticing as well because um, Mike, if he uh, he listened to the audiobook, read the book, and then he started to get to work on the adaptation and he made a script. But there was a lot of back and forth between the scripts, getting that balance between the core concepts of the story, what I felt I needed, but also I was trying to give Mike, uh, as he mentioned, as much free reign as possible because it needs to fit well on the page. And that is mm -hmm. the area where you're the expert. And right, so right. knowing which uh, beats would be appropriate in, in terms of, uh, you know, the flow of the uh, what we're seeing visually and when it's time to get a splash page, something really epic, but then when we have a bit more time to break it up. Uh, and so... How many versions of the script did we end up doing on this? Oh. Like six, maybe? I can't remember. Uh, boy, um, 
between beats to breakdowns to dialogued actual script. Yeah, I think six or seven, maybe eight. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things that, um, uh, you know, we actually talked about before we really even got the first script together was the nature of the breakdown and adaptation because mm -hmm. the book's too big to fit into a single graphic. Oh, yeah. I mean, you yeah. could, but it'll be really big. And, uh, and I would, it would take too long to make and I don't have the money to produce something like that. Yeah. But if you broke it up into segments, then we can. And then it's a matter of finding the right points in the story that more self-contained and fit together. Yeah, and, and Shadow of the Conqueror, it, it has these great internal arcs. There's okay. a character called Blackheart, and there's an arc with a Blackheart, the character Blackheart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that 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 arc in and of itself is just going to make a fantastic, just contained story. But, you know, you feed it into the previous arc, and you feed it into the future arc, and it all just merges into this one glorious, you know, uh, tale that you've told. And, and so it's really fun finding those those arcs in the entirety of your book that we can make these great self-contained stories but serialized into your total tale so the next thing that has been uh, like awesome for me is the the nature of the visual adaptive process because i have uh, visualized so many things in the book uh, a certain way and then conveying that getting actually depicted to such you know incredible quality so of course is satisfying but it's also been interesting because sometimes the, the way I, de I visualized it doesn't look as good when it's depicted according to my exact specifications and then sometimes mm. mike actually you know because he is far more talented artist he can tweak things to make it look far better and uh, and there's a bit of a balance there because some there are some things that I'm actually a real stickler on, and this is what I've also found with working with Project Steradia on the short film adaptation. Because there are some things where I'm like, hey, you know, I it's, it's different, but it works really well, and it obviously makes sense why you've changed it. But there are other things that I've been like massive stickler on, and it needs to be this way <laughs> and stuff. But seeing you at, like effectively translate descriptions into the visual world has been awesome because it's not like your regular medieval fantasy and so for yeah. i remember when we we're talking about the nature of the buildings the architecture and the style mm -hmm. and stuff and uh, just being able to look up the references that okay this this area looks a bit with these buildings and these buildings and then sending you just vague references and then you taking that adapting it and then actually illustrating new buildings based on those references but still in that style that's now depicting this world has been awesome to see like uh, that has been just a real fun thing but like for instance like this is an interesting thing the design of imperius the sword that's like yeah. something that it, it looks like this <laughs> there's no there's no room to move i've designed it i want it to be iconic i want it to be recognizable between versions now right. funny there, there are ways that you could stick within the design like adding you know, a certain pattern on the on the actual uh, sweepings and bars of the cross garden stuff, which um, you know, you could only really depict if you're making real art. But there are other ways you can kind of play with design, but keeping it the core visual design, and that's always been. It has to look like that, and yeah. like things like Dalen's jacket. Um, but then there are other things where you have heaps of room to move on, like skyships. Skyships mm. function on these kind of design principles, and if you work within those. You're, you're free reign, you know? Um, right. And so seeing all the different things, like, what was it like? Because this is, a, I'm actually really interested in the comparison now, working with George with um, a hedge knight, because you're saying that he was really involved. Was he, like, what were the things he was particular on about the keeping things the, the way he wanted in terms of the visual style and look? Well, it's funny because you're, one of the things you first said to me, I believe, was, was that you liked how realistic I kept the armor and the designs yeah. and stuff. Uh, the very first thing I went to George with was like fantasy armor. And he's like, no, no, we're not doing that. This is going to be all <laughs> realistic. And, uh, you know, hedge knight, you know, hedge knights are poor. They, they have maybe a suit of mail or some leather armor and maybe a, a pauldron here, or a, you know, uh, a, some greaves that they found off a corpse in the field or something like that. And so he's telling me about, it's like, Stay grounded, stay real. And back then there was no internet, so I actually grabbed these. I had, I had, these aren't the only ones, but I had like tons of, you know, these books you'd get at Barnes and Noble and just, you know, weapons and armor and everything. And I was just constantly doing research and looking for, for stuff that would look good and fit each character. Like, like he was telling me, 
you know, hedge knights are poor. But if you've got a Lannister rolling out, he's like, he'd be wearing a Rolls Royce. You know, it's like everything. He's all white armor. His horse has to be gilded to the rims with with filigree and patterns. And you know, like they spent, you know, the equivalent of half a million dollars decking out their their horse, you know, in this in a modern context. And so I, I just try to keep that in mind. And I tried to keep very, very realistic um, I did a lot of research into what kind of gilding and what kind of filigree and what kind of, uh, all that stuff they would do, um, more so, you know, maybe not as much as in Hedge Knight, but, uh, I, do, I also do the covers for the Game of Thrones books. And so when, when it was my time to do Jamie in his decked out golden armor, when he's going through the Whispering Woods, um, I went to town because I only had to draw it one time. It's not like something I had to design and then draw it 400 times in a comic book. <laughs> it was like, here's the cover. I'm going to do this the way George would want it. And it was just, it, it, he looks ridiculous, but glorious, but <laughs> realistic because there were back then, boy, those guys spent a ton making themselves look all spit polished and, and cool. So uh, that's kind of the way I approached it then um, with what you're doing, uh, you know, I have to make up some technology and stuff because this isn't just yeah. a medieval fantasy world, right? It is, and it's not even a steampunk world. Yeah. It is a yeah. stone driven technology. <laughs> exactly. They, they take all you this know? on dark stone and sun stone. I, I, you're absolutely right. I just want to kind of inject because that's the, that's one of the interesting things about Everfall is that there are many grounded, very realistic things that you could actually kind of draw an equivalent from. And a good mm -hmm. example is actually the Dragoon armor. Because we had mm. a bit of a back and forth about the Dragoon armor. Because the um, the armor actually, this is one of the, the bonus things you get in the graphic novel that you don't actually get in the original book, okay? Is that on sky ships in a military context, they have shock troops called Dragoons. Now, I'm using a similar word that, you know, of a historical type of unit, but that's, that's the, uh, it's just the unit type and everything else is different, basically. They're just basically a shock troop that are being used from sky ships. Mm -hmm. In the book, Dalen mentions that he could take a city with a single skyship and number of degrees, and that's it. But because we're, we're by the nature of this adaptation, we've taken this first portion and we needed just to round it off a bit. And it gave us an opportunity to actually add something in. And part of that addition had dragoons in it. And so you actually get to see dragoons depicted. And this and the the um the back and forth on the armor was great because this is like it's like an insanely put together complex version of full plate, similar to some of mm -hmm. the last versions of full plate that we see at the beginning of the Renaissance, you know, where uh, Henry was it Henry the fifth. He has armor where you could barely put an, a, a pin in between the gaps. It's that mm -hmm. complex. It's even got like the, uh, the parts on the uh, armpit that's fully armored, which you usually never saw that on full plate. And that's how it, and so they've advanced to that point. That is regular soldier armor. Yet they have that technological basis of the dark stone and sunstone and dark stone yeah. to move things. And so I had already, because now I'm working on book, I've started book two, even though it's not the next book I'm currently working on, but there are parts that are, but in book two, uh, beginning of book two has dragoons in, and I already had the descriptions and, and I already had this before in book one, of course, um, about how they work and that they have Darkstone incorporated into some of the joint mechanics and levitations to the point where they it enhances their strength and they can levitate a bit. But that in that meant having certain joint mechanic parts on the actual movements and yep. and 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 so how that would look, I didn't really. I just I, yeah, I had a vague idea, but then depicting it exactly, that's where we had this back and forth. And you you were the one who came up with the ultimate design of how that's incorporated. Yeah, I so I, I did more of a, a, a belt fed um pulley to, yeah. to strengthen the 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 ability of, of the joints to move so that you could, you know, it's sort of like it turns into a like an exosuit, right? Yeah. So you can jump higher, you can well, plus he's they they have the thing so they can fly so <laughs> on the back. <laughs> um but that's all yeah, that's all the technology based around the stones, the dark stones, light stones in, in your world, sunstones and that's fun playing with that because, you know, my dad was an engineer. And so I kind of always had that sort of a, you know, I used to like design my own transformers and, and draw them frame by frame, how they would transform. And just this, it's kind of playing with ideas like that, that you've set forth was it's really right up my wheelhouse. So that was a lot of fun too.
Well, it really is because because you worked on Game of Thrones, I know you could do armor really, really well. And this was kind of like working with something that was very grounded in, like in history and stuff. And then it was like 80% history with 20 or even 10% fantasy additions to make the uh, make it come together. And it came together and it looks really, really cool. And so, again, that's just one of the awesome things that I've been able to, you know, be experienced, have the experience in uh, doing in the adaptation. And I... I, I laughed when you said that, you know, old George says, no, we got to do it realistic. I was like, good <laughs> on George, man. I love it. Because uh, Game of Thrones has always been more grounded. And that was one of the things, I mean, I don't have um, the first one, the Hedge Knight. Uh, uh, I put it somewhere and I don't have it on the hand at the moment. But I've got the Sworn Sword, which is the, mm. the second volume of the Hedge Knight graphic novel series. And I actually showed up on the screen um, a shot of, I think it was one of the Lannister's armors that you had done. Um, and so we can bring that back up here. And because one of the things that really impressed me when I first picked up the Hedge Knight, I found it randomly in a, in a, a graphic novel store uh, in Melbourne. Mm. I was walking around, I was looking, I was like, I don't often see somewhat accurate, mostly accurate armor depicted in comic books. This is interesting because the cover of the, of the Hedge Knight is, you know, Duncan is holding the sword out. And I was like, I see a sword that has my interest automatically. <laughs> picked it up. And I was flicking through and I was like, wow, th like this, this was clearly a graphic novel where the artist had gone the extra mile in, in depicting things so much better than nearly everything else. Um, but when I see like some of the joint parts depicted accurately, like mm -hmm. here's the part that I was looking for, right? If you have a look at the uh, shoulder piece right there. I've, I've rarely ever seen armor depicted in such detail with such accurate attention detail and accuracy like that with the pauldrons covering the right areas and things. I was just like, this is, this is great. I I'm getting it. I'm getting it. Then, um, You're like, this guy's so more retentive. I love it. <laughs> the jousting scenes in Hedge Knight. That was like, okay. I got a little crap from, uh, from George about that because, uh, because I was referencing A Knight's Tale, which is one of my favorite movies. I love A Knight's Tale. It's one of my favorite movies. George is like, that's not how lances break. But we left it in for... <laughs> that point brings up a really interesting thing, because it's the rule of cool balance. Because I can really... like there's a, I understand why they did it in A, a Knight's Tale. Tale. And I also can understand why, because it creates more visual, you know, spectacle, yeah. having the, 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 the things fly off. And that's one of the areas where I'm actually perfectly okay with a slight concession to realism if it makes it look really cool. Because it's not yeah. a big concession. It's not, it's not like you're, you know, making some big travesty against historical realism and stuff. Right. Just get a bit of extra visual flair. I'm actually okay with that. As, as particular and elitist as I might seem at times on my channel about things, there is a portion where the rule of cool I'm like totally on board with. And that's yeah. a great example of exactly one of those times. Because the jousting scenes in Hedge Knight are amazing. They're some of the most visually impressive pieces in that, especially the double page spread where you've got the... Um, the two lines of knights clashing. That was yeah, just trial cool. of seven. And I, I look, I could rant on and on about the things that I like, because that's one of my favorite graphic novels and everything like, you know, the depiction of the heraldry on the clothing and also the clothing on the, the, the cloths on the horses and stuff, the horse armor and everything like so much of it was just brilliant. And thank you. Like, so yeah, uh, that was pretty cool. When you reached out to me, I remember thinking, uh, yeah, <laughs> like, uh, that, was, that was awesome. And now working with you uh, has been phenomenal. And the end results has been uh, as good as I could have dreamed. And I say, because people say it's better than I could have dreamed. Well, I can dream pretty big. Um, <laughs> and so having something that has is meeting my very high and specific expectations, where it is literally as good a quality graphic novel as I think is possible to make in terms of art quality, but also... Uh, I, I'm biased with the story, of course. <laughs> I was, a wee bit, a bit. <laughs> uh, and so I'm just over the moon about that. That's just uh, very excited. And so, guys, the graphic novel, again, 
it's going to be launched on Indiegogo and it's going to have a launch campaign window that we're thinking of being able to kick off in January. Uh, I'll be letting you know. And uh, and so, yeah, you'll, you'll get the alert, but you can sign up ahead of time on the Indiegogo preview page um, that's available there as well. But mm -hmm. if they're interested in graphic novels and you've been able to see some of Mike's art, which is, you can tell, is just awesome okay mike also has other works that he has made himself when he said he's a writer as well as an artist he is did you want to tell us a little bit about uh, personal graphic novels so lone star yeah yeah lone star is a project i've been working on for a couple of years so i'm working on the third chapter right now uh the first one was lone star heart of the hero then the second was lone star soul of the soldier the third one is mind of the monster and it's basically this this hero from world war ii who um he was just a pilot. He was like the best pilot in the Navy. Um, and he was tasked with taking down the Ubermensch. So in, I have a, a history that, that man has forgotten where, where uh, it was kind of rewritten to make it, make it kind of hide the truth about what was going on in Germany. But he, Hitler had an Ubermensch who was helping him just take over Europe. And so these American special fighter pilots went over there, took down the Ubermensch. Um, Lone Star died quote unquote died um there but he was he was actually on his deathbed and he was given this opportunity where you know it would save his life but he would have to functionally be dead to the world so he was all of his teammates in what's called the unknown soldiers they're like the they're they're killed in action and then they're recruited into this super super secret project it was actually started by teddy roosevelt um of of monster hunters they're given superpowers um, and they go out and they hunt the things that that you know cause the nightmares of men. And so, in this story, the main villain is a guy named Svarog. He's a he's an 800 year old vampire. He Lone Star in the first issue. They go in and they whack his his pride. I call my vampire. They don't call them covens. I call them prides for specific reasons that you'll have to figure out. But um, so he whacks his whole pride. Svarog gets away, uh, and then causes problems uh, <laughs> throughout the rest of the three stories. Um, the third book, which is the one I think Shad's going to like the most, because the whole first half of it, uh, the first 20, 23, 24 pages, is Svarog's origin story, which, it's, like I said, starts in 1200, uh, roughly 1200 Rus, and then he, you know, goes I mean, through. I've the, been seeing the images you've been, you know, posting on Twitter, sneak yeah. previews and stuff. And there's, I'm like, that's a lot of swords. At first I was confused. I thought Lone Star was like modern, but there's all these <laughs> It looks great. So I'm thinking <laughs> flashback sequence, someone goes back in time or something like that. Um, and, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a backstory and it's looking awesome. Like, Thank, thanks. Yeah, I was I was worried about showing you the, uh, the, the fake Mongol uh, <laughs> armor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really using more Japanese pauldrons than than anything the Mongols ever wore, but I God, Mongol Mongol stuff's boring. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can and just you, know, you watch, watch you watch movies you like you watch like uh, um, Marco Polo or some of these things, and it's like you're watching it and it looks so cool, and you're like, yeah, the Mongols didn't wear that. <laughs> but it's like like you said, the cool factor, right? It's got to yes, yes. it's got to look cooler than than anything but, else. So um, the rule of cool, but you also have room to move in fantasy. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you could always <laughs> say that the, this is a, a special type of tribe of Mongols or something like yeah. that. You know, well, hey, yeah. If I can have an alternate history for for World War Two, I can have uh, you know Japanese pauldrons on Mongols. <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> no, so I, I get that. I get that. I, my my kind of my back gets up more when they're actually depicting a historical event or something like that. And it's like, you know, like Braveheart or, or mm. Owl King was done well, but then there was the King and that was, uh, and yeah, so that, that's when I'm more particular. But when in, in fantasy, of course you have more room to move. But yeah. 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 Also good is that you're also basing the armor off other cultures that, are, and it, I, I, you know, that you're drawing armor that's inspired off something that is realistic in and of itself. And so, True. I, and you know what it's a superhero comic we're just doing a backstory <laughs> but it, it, boy it, it, you know it's you can tell because of the mongol pages how much i love drawing this stuff and i'm sitting there thinking maybe i shouldn't do superhero comics because i just love drawing all this stuff mm -hmm. so much and i just love drawing like armies fighting just just hundreds of characters just like in in clash battle 
and uh yeah it, it's so like even in um uh, i did another book last year called monster hunt we're doing we're doing the uh, the second book but i'm not writing or drawing it um but because i wanted to do these scenes with just hundreds and hundreds of people fighting i created a character uh seance who could raise souls from the ground and give them physicality and control them and so like i had i had pirates that were like in chicago and i had like pirates and and brits and indians and just all these people just rising from the ground and just to create this giant war scene even though i didn't have that many characters in the book because <laughs> <laughs> I'm a glutton for punishment. I love drawing those things. It's I don't know why. It's... It, it seems to be your specialty at the moment because <laughs> you know, done with time, Game of Thrones, Dragonlands. Yeah. Oh yeah. Hold on a second. Let me uh <laughs> you haven't seen it. But yeah, I did it back here. Just like these giant oh. double page spreads of, of uh <laughs> See, that's great. I love it. And then this this book actually started with just three double page spreads of just So that's all... the Aiel. Is it? Yeah. So, can you talk about because you mentioned to me just in passing, you got to work with Robert Jordan on yeah. new, the new Spring graphic novel. That's huge, okay? Because unfortunately, Robert Jordan has passed; is no longer with us, which is yeah. a tragedy. Um, but you got to work with him while he was mm -hmm. alive. And what was the adaptive process like? Because this is interesting. Wheel, there's a Wheel of Time. Um, uh, there's a Wheel of Time TV show being made, and so. Mm -hmm. There has been some interesting discussion about um, uh, the adapt the adaptation, see how characters are depicted, um, cultures, and things like that. But you got to work with Robert, Robert directly. Yeah. I mean, he wasn't as hands on as George was, but he was he was uh, a, he he was approving all of the character designs, and basically, yeah, he did approve everything, but he wasn't. He wasn't like I wasn't talking to him on the phone all the time. I just I met him a couple times. We had dinner one time. Um, and one thing he did say to me uh, was that, you know, he, he's been writing those books for decades and people have been drawing Trollocs for that entire time. And he told me that uh, I drew Trollocs more like what he had in his mind than anyone else ever had. Um and then, unfortunately, like you said, he did pass away shortly after. So uh, if the movie company wants to make Trollocs like as close to what uh, Jim wanted, then they should look at the New Spring books. That's big. That's huge. Like, could you give us – like, do you have a picture of a Trolloc that you did? Yeah, I'm trying to find it. It wasn't in the first issue. So let me, let me skim through here real quick. Um, I did a bunch of – oh. I don't know if it's too dark for you to see, but there's another double page spread. <laughs> I, okay. Like, unfortunately, it's pixelated. Maybe you could send us a scan or something, but I can, I'm making it. Oh, wait, now it's starting to focus. That's interesting, really, because honestly, their, their eyes and forehead are far more human than even I was visualizing. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's what he said. He's, he's like, the eyes and forehead are just human. And then the bottom of the ha bottom half is where the, all the all the beastly characters come up. So it, it's almost Absolutely. like they're wearing a, a mask, you know. Wow, that on, that honestly surprises me because I like I've seen other pictures of Trollocs, and you know when they depicted that certain Trollocs had the face of a wolf, which is a big plot point in regards to the character Perrin because um, white cloaks, you know, kill Trollocs, and Perrin has a connection with wolves, and there are certain Trollocs with wolf heads and stuff. So mm -hmm. I was picturing a full wolf head, like. But it's more the snout. Yep. yep. It's it's like uh, you know we wear those masks today. If you just made yeah. one green and you green screened it and you put a, and you know, you have direct <laughs> confirmation. A, a eagle. Bro. Eagle. <laughs> He's telling me about the eagles. It's like super rare to get an eagle, uh, trollic that survives because they'll most of the time they'll have like eagle limbs and they can't survive like that, right? <laughs> so they have to be born with like human limbs, but just. So essentially, it just seems like it's the eagle beak on a human, and oh. otherwise they die. So, gosh. Weird. Yeah. So, and this is this is I like to me this is big because I'm a huge Wheel of Time fan, and it's just really cool that you have direct confirmation from Robert Jordan himself of yeah. uh, how. If he... I still had my AOL account, I could probably dig up the email. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, it was a while ago. Like, because I'm very. 
I'm very interested in how this uh, TV show is going to look. And uh, and yeah, I, it's kind of I'm I'm a bit nervous at the same time, but because we've seen adaptations just butcher things. Uh, mm -hmm. I really, I really want to get a copy of this now because now, like, I want to, I want to look at how you depicted Swan and Moraine and especially Lan. Did did Georgia mention anything about how Lan was uh, supposed to look? Uh, Jordan. Um, oh, Jordan. I, Robert. I, Robert. I Lan's not in New Spring, is he? Yeah, that's the story of how Moraine meets Lan. Oh, okay. See, I only did the first half. Ah, okay, okay. So I didn't get to that part. That's interesting. So uh, what happened? Is it just scheduling conflicts and stuff and you couldn't finish? Um, it was more of an issue with the with the producers on the project. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then they just kind of... Uh, and, and it, it was issues. <laughs> yeah, as issues happen. It's funny, issues I, happen. Yes. I, don't, I don't want to mention any names, but I've talked <laughs> with some other authors who... Uh, mm -hmm have been adapting their novels into graphic novels and one um was working through a comic book industry and he mentioned that it was really difficult working with him honestly and he was like hey i'm interested in how your graphic novel is going to go because it's it's just been like just issues um essentially mm -hmm. and it looked like there were a dis it was hard to see eye to eye on how certain things would be depicted or adapted and stuff like that and he, and he just mentioned that he was interested in um how my how well you know my graphic novel will turn out and so far it's been like a dream come true in the sense that it is literally as good as i could have dreamed it for it to be we'll mm. see how well it does when when it releases i i i'm very confident people are gonna love it because i love it and uh, and the quality is so good that i mean i've got I've got my old collection of comic books here. I, unfortunately, I don't have nearly as much as I used to, right? But I could whip out. And this is like in the more, when would you say the golden age of Marvel comics and DC? Oh, for me, the 80s. The 80s? Yeah. See, because I was more in the 90s. Um, yeah. So. And, uh, but there were there are many, many comic books, and I know I still own several, where you open it up and the artwork, you know, but what's what's really sad? I'll, I'll explain that to you. Uh, the oh. '90s were the boom, and they were hiring everybody who could pick up a pencil, uh, because every stink is, dude. It's like money corrupts everything, right? <laughs> <laughs> so much money was coming into the comic book industry that they were hiring just people who should not have been drawing books. Um, but because it's like, hey, it's a new blah blah. blah. I don't want to name anybody because people will be like, oh, I drew that. But you know, <laughs> say this this character gets her own series, and it's like it sells. You know, a million, no, not a million, but it sells 500,000 copies. And then you pick it up and you're like, eh, why are you doing this? <laughs> <laughs> because you'll buy it, dummy. Yeah. <laughs> well, what but that's what happened in the 90s. In the 80s, it was, look, your, your book was good or it got canceled. Uh, in the 90s, it was, if your book sells less than 100,000, you'll get canceled. Well, it was it, the 90s whether like... it was good or not, it was just they were just pumping out number one issue after number one issue, and just it was it was insane. Not to say there wasn't good stuff in the 90s, there absolutely was, but um, it it was it was it was a glut time for the industry, and I don't I honestly don't know if they ever recovered from it. Well, that's the unfortunate thing because I was literally going to say, and even back then, I could see that the art was like you know okay. But compare that to what you see DC and Marvel making now. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. It's like, what has happened to you guys? Oh, you know, it, it's it's an interesting conundrum because as far as business wise, I think I, I can't slight them for making the decision that they want to go after artists who have fan bases on social media right you see somebody on instagram they've got two million followers and you're like hey why don't you draw my comic book and then get some of your two million followers to back it whatever i don't know if it worked but from a business perspective it makes sense right I mean, yeah, only but, only if you're trying to market to that own audience right i mean if, as soon as you're trying to reach outside of that audience, you're going to be judged onto far more almost uh, stringent standards of just 
people who don't know things because this is an interesting this is how i approach my youtube videos right i try mm -hmm. and structure my videos that sometimes this is a video that's going to be for my established fan base but other mm -hmm. times i know this video is going to be reach reaching outside of my fan base and when i'm making that video because i know it's going to happen i literally make the video somewhat different like i go mm -hmm. over some of the basic information of swords or something if i'm just talking about a sword because i know a lot of people who are watching this will be watching my content for the first time and they won't know right. the background knowledge. And so I make it to accommodate for outside of my fan base because it's just smart business. It's just like, you know, yeah. because it's the thing. Like my videos will only go viral if I can tap into my any like the group outside of my audience. If I can tap into the larger YouTube audience outside of my core fan base. If I only like rely on my core fan base, my videos will only get between 50 to 100,000 views. If I mm. want to hit, you know, mm. up to, and, well, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's <laughs> all a matter of perspective, is it? And I apologize. Yeah. I know, I know. Is it, That is a weird position to be in that, to be able to say only 50 to 100,000. Yeah. Really, <laughs> it really honestly is a bit of a wake up call to me because tell me if, if I said that, I, I would not have been able to say that when I, back when I had, I had 10,000 subscribers. All right. Um, and so it's a completely different perspective on growth. So sorry, I got, I'm glad you called me out on that because you're absolutely right. But in terms of- Oh, hey, it's a great perspective. Well, well in terms of trying to, because reach the, like there, there's, I, I am a large creator now, but I'm not a mainstream creator. These are guys that will get usually a million views a, a video. Mm. And I'm not sure if I'll ever reach that, but I can get the occasional video to go to that extreme. But that's only happens to me when I tap into the outside audience. Um, right. And it's funny because I do have a million subscribers, but like they subscribe for usually, this may be my experience, for certain types of content. They really like my archery videos or they really like my reviews in Star Wars and stuff. But I'm not mm. making archery videos every video or Star Wars. It's, it's, a, it's a mixed bag. And that's what I like doing. It keeps things diverse, keeps me interesting and stuff. But because of that, the audience, my subscribers that have subscribed for a particular type of content usually only watch that type of content, which is perfectly fine. <laughs> totally mm -hmm. um, entitled for that, which actually gives me certain advantages outside. But it also means that I don't get <laughs> like, and this is the same across the board on YouTube, by the way, you only get like 10% of your subscriber base in views in that. And, and then if you get one, get any more, you actually need to reach outside your own audience. Mm -hmm. And so this goes back now connecting it back to what you're saying about artists and things like that. I, I think they're shooting themselves in the foot, like massively. It's like, because I bet, I, I almost guarantee, right? Is that, all right, there's this artist on Twitter or whatever, and they have a million followers. They make something with that. They're not going to get a million, you know, things. And like the translation of those sales from that pre-existing audience would be between, I would say, one to 10%, mm. like around there. And sometimes it will be only 1% because most of that audience won't be interested in it. I like true. It's true. Most of that audience, they're they're flippers. Yeah. Well, well the know? other thing, right? <laughs> there are there are many uh, critics, pop culture critics in the world that criticize how video games are done. We're seeing uh, very much with the Mandalorian at the moment, where they're crying outrage on many many things, right? And what I'm finding is that a lot of them, especially people that are criticizing video game stuff, don't play video games. I, 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 and a lot of the people criticizing comic books, especially like the how uh, comic book heroes are usually depicted, usually the women, right? Mm -hmm. They don't read comic books, yet they're demanding comic books be changed to suit their tastes when yeah. they're not the audience. And if you conform to these, you know, uh, demands, you're just going to undermine the pre-existing audience you have catering to people who don't even read it. And which I'm, they have managed to do. Which they have managed to like, <laughs> do. That has been what I have been observing, what's been happening to modern day comic books. And it's baffling. Like, And so you have, like for me- Well, I... well not, not to really argue the point, but it seems like that's the stuff that gets the attention. I'd, honestly, I don't, I don't frequent comic book stores anymore and I haven't for a while, but it seems like there's usually, um, I don't know, half a dozen um, really stupid decisions that DC or Marvel will make any given month. And, you know, these guys publish 300 books a month. So it is it is the stuff that gets the attention because they're trying to do this outreach and they're they are they're literally well, OK, they're figuratively giving the middle finger to the hardcore guys, the guys that do go in every Wednesday to buy their comic books. Um, but they're doing outreach to. 
I don't know who the hell they're doing outreach to, but they're trying, <laughs> right? They're trying to they're trying to find a new audience because, uh, frankly, the guys that are going into the comic shops, they're you know they're my age. They have high blood pressure. They're gonna start mm-hmm. dropping off of. Uh, I'm yeah. older. Look, I, I um, get that. I get, <laughs> and I think there's nothing wrong with trying to court a new audience, right? But yeah. I really do feel that there is a pre-existing fan base and audience that is still hungry for this stuff, and so instead of taking away what the core fan base liked and had and changing it to court a new audience. Why don't you just create something for the new audience and keep what they have and I, everyone's happy. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. No, that's the problem is when you take these, uh, what, are, what is the word, the legacy characters, and you try to you try to change them to do the outreach. And that, no, that's, that, that is a betrayal of everything that, you know, those of us who've been reading comics since we're in third grade, you know, since the, early eighties for the, for me, um, that, that betrays everything that we've loved about comics. No, you're absolutely right. If you want to do something new to reach those new people, like literally just do something new. You've got how much money to advertise to these new people. And if you, if you do want to reach out through someone on Instagram with 3 million subs or whatever it is, um, why don't you create something with them that, tailors to their audience and then bring that as a new character into whatever company yeah, you're doing. Absolutely. And right. I do think a balance can be made in terms of using legacy characters, as long as you don't betray the legacy characters or take away what was originally there. I think a good example, there's a cartoon called DC superhero girls that my daughter loves, you know, she watched a good amount, And I, I think there's absolutely room for that, but guess what? Little boys still want their cartoons. Okay. And my mm. boys aren't into DC superhero girls. They they get they want to see Batman bashing up bad guys as he always has been. And so you can have both, okay? Because the fun thing about DC superhero girls is that it's not changing what the core characters are. This is its own little universe. It's even a different adaptation that's catered for a different audience, young girls, of course. Mm-hmm. And that's, you can do that, okay? As long as you're not taking away what these original characters were and you're not changing the mainstream kind of storylines, canon and other things and chopping up things completely. Because that's what I've been kind of seeing. I've been seeing what you're saying. They take yeah. the legacy characters, catering them to a different audience and the original audience is like, well, and it's not even just the original audience. It is the missed opportunity that we've had for 15 years now to do outreach into the broader world to bring people into this art form. Look, I I make comic books. I love comic books. I don't just love comic book characters, and I don't just want to see them on screen, right, or on the the movie screen or the TV screen or the or on Netflix or whatever. I want to I want to make comic books for Pete's sake, and for all this time. And all this, all this money and all this exposure, Marvel and DC, Warner Brothers, uh, Disney, they did nothing mm. to introduce those fans of Thor and Spider-Man and Hulk to comic books. And not just did they do nothing, Marvel, and to a lesser extent DC, at the time when these movies were the biggest thing on planet Earth, actively changed all of the main characters in the comic books i i literally heard this story from somebody who worked at a comic book shop a mother and a son came into the comic shop because it was right next to the movie theater at the mall right down here and he she's like um you know we just got out of seeing thor can we see a thor cup she goes over to the thing and it's jane what's her face as thor and it's yeah. like he's like no i want I just saw Chris Hemsworth with his rippling that? abs on the screen. I want that Thor. And they're like, uh, you're going to have to buy some back issues or something. It's like they literally walked out without buying a book. And, and like had the perfect opportunity. I know. I, I, it's not to say that there isn't room for a female Asgardian hero. No. But it's that some people like Thor, the actual, you know, the original Thor, uh, seeing what he's doing. And your example is, is perfect on the money about that. It's like you see the, because the current, is, it's interesting. Marvel, the cinematic universe is kind of, they've been playing catch up to the comic books because they have so much, you know, stuff to work on. And now it's almost, I'm, I'm nervous because it seems like they might be jumping onto some uh, of the things that co- current modern day Marvel has been doing. And it's like, you've been working with some great stuff and there's still a lot of great stuff there. Okay. Um, and if you, 
And I'm not, I'm not saying you can't do things based on what modern day Marvel is doing, but if you're changing re- legacy characters and stuff like that and undermining what made them popular to serve different audiences, shooting yourself in the leg, I, I yeah. massively. You can make stuff for new audiences, but don't take away the things that have been working so well and what current audiences have that's been right, but that, That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to piggyback on the fame and the and the notoriety and, uh, uh, and the legacy of these characters so that they can squeeze their their nouveau agenda, whatever you want to call it into, into the space because they know that, you know, if you just go out and you create female Asgard character, um, boy, she's going to have to stand on her own, but you're going to have your Thor completists, right? Who are, yeah, can I, can I interject? Right. Cause yeah. this is the, being the baffling thing. Cause I actually think it could be possible for people to make stories that, have certain nods to uh, ideologies even, but also ideas that they kind of agree with. Because politics has been integrated in subtle ways in every story imaginable. Mm -hmm. It's when it becomes so blatant that it's a slap in the face and it's at the detriment of good quality writing where they put their agenda in front of the story and they just make garbage. Because I actually do think, you know, like I have my own political views and stuff like that, right? And yeah. I, th- I think absolutely people of the opposing political views can not only write stories with certain nods to their own beliefs and stuff and still make good stories. And on top of that, I think it's perfectly possible for me to still be able to enjoy that story if it's absolutely. not like a bloody slap in the face. Yeah. Mean- yeah. No, absolutely. And it's, look, I'm not going to... I've, I've worked with two of who I think are a couple of the best writers I've ever worked with, Tom Taylor and and Mark Wade. Uh, hands down, t- the two best writers I've worked with, well, George R. R. Martin, but, you know, that was a good <laughs> um, In comics, those guys were the two best guys. But, boy, at some point, uh, something just kind of broke in their heads. And and they just, they, they got away from putting the story first. And like you said, they put the agenda first. And then everything just like crap, you know, you can only, you can, you can have a giant five gallon bowl of ice cream, but if you put a dog crap in there, you're eating dog crap and yeah. that's what they're doing. Right. And it's, it's, uh, it, it's, I feel terrible because they are such great talents. If they could just pull their head out of their agenda, then, you know, they can get back to just making great stuff. Well, here's a good example. And I, my point of reference, of course, is my own book. Okay. Um, I needed a character who was a despicable tyrant. And so as a tyrant, he was a leader of a nation. And so therefore, what was his political system? And so I then looked to history and uh, tried to inform myself from history, but I'm not going to be able to remove my own bias because after I look at history, then it's going to be, what do I think was one of the worst political systems of the past? Yeah. That, that, and, and so the character, well, I wanted something that well, I felt was authoritarian, uh, despotic, and things like that. And so this wasn't me forcing this on the character. It was that the, this character was a tyrant. And so under his you know, views, what ideology would he move to? And uh, that led me to the same thing that I see in history, which mm-hmm. essentially he was a bit of a Marxist. He was a bit of a communist, okay? And, uh, and uh, people have been able to point that out. Now, the thing is, though, that was a result of the story pushing it in that direction because people could mm-hmm. say it's a political statement. And I would, I would be lying to say if some of my own views don't seep in. I think every writer does it. But the forefront of it was actually the story and the characters, which is why my book, even though it actually deals with some fairly complex political things and concepts, that's not the slap in the face. Well, this is the interesting thing, because I know very well that there are many people who have vastly different political views than me who have read my book and really like it, like love it. And, and these are people, these are sometimes when people, like recently, someone even tweeted out my novel saying this is a great book. And I could mm-hmm. tell just from their profile that we disagree fundamentally on heaps of things, yet he loved my book. Because one of the, the big things, and I think this is something that is being so, like done so poorly in um, the types of uh, fictional works that are coming from really the uh, opposing side to my own political thing, my political leanings, is that they don't represent the views that they disagree with fairly. They mm-hmm. usually straw man them and misrepresent them because this was interesting. I had my um, when I got someone to look at my book early on, and they were vastly different from me. In fact, they were almost on the um, 
communist side, not that far, but they're almost there, right? And they read my book and I got them to read my book to get feedback as well, to represent people who had that view fairly. How would they interpret things? Because I wanted to go out, because even though there were political leanings of things, I, there are people who support Dalen and ultimately they disagree. But when they are arguing for their position, I wanted to steel man what they're arguing for and actually raise valid points. They're like, we support the conqueror because of these X reasons. And, right. and it's funny <laughs> when I got him to read this is saying, you do realize I have a point. Don't you? <laughs> and I'm like, well, good. That, that, that's why they, that's exist. right. That's right. You're, they you're do. look, you're the guys you disagree with in, like you're saying, you steel man them. You, you can't have cardboard cutouts as bad guys. Right. Yes. And, and, and the motivations of your character. That's why Svarog, I write Svarog. He is, he, I mean, he was part of the Soviet union. He worked with Stalin. Um, he comes to America, his perspective, he genuinely believes and you can't just like, ha ha ha, I am going to rule the world. I mean, yeah, I, it works great for, you know, G.I. <laughs> Joe, but if you want real well-rounded characters, um, yeah, you've got to play it. In fact, I, I, uh, <laughs> well, could I, just I, I don't remember because... who it was, but I showed it to, yeah. I showed, uh, issue one of Lone Star to a, uh, to a socialist and he's like he's like oh yeah Svarog's my favorite character because <laughs> like, yeah. I well, played I, I expressed his view so yeah. well as that character that they're they're like yeah I love that guy <laughs> I also want to interject and say something because because I hope people don't misinterpret because you said something uh to say that people uh, like when I depict people of the opposing you know views to myself I'm never defaulting them to always make them the bad guy. In fact, I have main characters right. who hold views that are vastly different. Dalen, my main character, has issues with free speech, okay? It comes up in the book where he has an argument with his companion, Arik, about the right and freedom to spout things that he sees as hateful, mm -hmm. funny, right? Um, I am very much personally on the side of free speech, but my main character isn't, okay? I just want to point yeah. out, because the reason why it fits in with like, that's what he, this character personally would naturally have that opinion. And so it's, yeah, and, and when you're, when you're a writer and you're doing your job, right. The someone who's reading your book with the clean slate shouldn't know what your political position is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hopefully the hopefully. character should be so well-rounded in what they believe that they they're believable. Views. Yeah. And yeah. I, I really see, these are some of the things that, um, and look, this is not to say that people who agree with me, that they can't make works that are really tone deaf in terms of how they depict their own views and mm -hmm. stuff. Of course, that exists as well. It just seems to be in my own subjective bias perspective. And maybe because I'm more sensitive to it, whenever I see someone who supposedly represents my views in many mainstream works at the moment, they're depicted like idiots or, or villains or something like that, where... and. And it annoys me. It, like, it annoys me so much. Uh, honestly, the only good thing that comes out of it is a, an encouragement for me to not do the same thing for people who yeah, disagree yeah, yeah. with me, to not straw man them in the works. And honestly, this is something that Brandon Sanderson has mentioned many times, and I'm echoing him, that because he, he would talk it about in the scope of religion, because he, we're actually of the same faith, Brandon and I. And whenever hmm. he would see someone depicted of a, of a religious faith in a book as idiots, or as the person, like, it would bug him so much. And so he was saying, no, if you're going to be representing views and opinions that are either of your own or especially of ones that you disagree with, do it the way that they would want them to see themselves represented. Okay? Yes. And by doing that, you can please an audience of multiple political views. And I'm really satisfied to see that Shadow of the Conqueror has achieved exactly that. I've got people who love it, who are of vastly different political views than me, and that's awesome. You are like, more fans the better, are you know? Like, yeah. the fact yep, that yep, some yep. people would say they don't want those types of fans, I'm like, one, it causes di vast division in the world, okay? It's, it creates more tribalism, things like that. And it's also elitism and gatekeeping, saying, no, you can't enjoy fantasy or the things I like because you disagree with me politically. It's like, what the hell? Come off it. Yeah. You like swords yeah. or fantasy or comic <laughs> books? You're more than welcome, okay? I, I like the quote from um, Michael Jordan. You know, what was it? Republicans still buy shoes? Is that the thing? <laughs> I think you're right. I think you're I, right. I think someone asked him about it, some political controversy at the time, and he didn't want to weigh in on they why. And he says, because Republicans still buy shoes. And, and yeah. I kind of see myself in that position as an entertainer. Of course, I have political views. Uh, but 
people aren't here to hear my political hot takes. They're here to either learn about swords and be entertained and things. Yeah. And so that's always been my approach to uh, not be disingenuous to that, because I value my audience, no matter what their political yeah. views are. And, and your book is is about entertainment and fantasy. It is not a piece of propaganda, and it shouldn't yes. be. And it should never. That's propaganda. Look, there's a place for parody, but there's if you're just writing something that you're intending to in, in, entertain people with, and shoving political ideologies down their throat, that's that's it. Just doesn't work. It's not entertaining. You've lost the the entire purpose of the craft. Yeah, but that, of course, that's not to say that I don't have certain messages that I purposely wanted Shadow of the No, Horror. but they're, nat they're naturally occurring, they're organic, they're part of the story, because story comes first. Yeah, and I will admit, there are messages I wanted to make in Shadow of the Conqueror. One was about the nature of forgiveness. Um, that mm -hmm. was one of the big things that I wanted to explore with the character. But this is not to say I never said at any point, and uh, it's satisfying to see reviewers and people actually say that I achieve this, is that I don't tell people... If they should forgive him, I don't tell people that Dalen is even worthy of forgiveness. Right. I wanted to just explore. No, but your, yeah, your story has a theme. Every good yes. story has a theme. Has a theme, and even a message um, intertwined in there that people are then able to make their own choices on. That was kind of the, my goals. Um, yeah. You asked we, the question. <laughs> I've gotten a little bit more in the controversial things, but I think this is it's fine. I, I I value these types of discussions still, especially because this is in the realm that I explore. I'm an entertainer. I'm a creator, mm -hmm. and. Uh, when I've seen certain mainstream pop properties really fail, I think it's really because of some of the things we've been pointing out. And mm -hmm. it's not actually because they're of the opposite political leanings to me, because I see failings of people, as I mentioned, people who agree with me in the same political leanings and stuff. It's more about how you approach it, okay? And to what level you in, uh, are putting in your own views and also how well you represent the other side. That is, a, that's such a key. If you, if you want to, tap into a, a wider audience as possible don't insult your fan base don't that's right, that's right. don't cartoon character I, I, again excusing them. parody excusing parody don't yeah. make a cartoon out of people you disagree with <laughs> i know it's important about parody because you know there's the magnificent seven which is hilarious. <laughs> that's right. that is a parody <laughs> comic but it's intended to be full-throated yeah I, I, I can laugh at jokes at the expense of in the complete reverse to what the Magnificent Seven was for. But in actual yeah. fact, the thing is, you only see parody going one way in most mainstream media at the moment. And so I was like, I feel the Magnificent Seven, even though, of course, because it's parody, there's a certain group of people who just despise it. But I think every side deserves to have their own parody and stuff. And, uh, <laughs> and I can laugh. I can laugh at, you know, things on either side. And just yeah. as much as I think Magnificent Seven is, is hilarious, I can laugh just as much when something is a parody at the expense of something else, which we get constantly in mainstream media yep. anyway. Uh, hey, funny's funny. All right. <laughs> you know, I think this is actually a really good spot. We've been able to talk about some awesome, really in-depth stuff. So we're going to wrap it up now. I want to thank Mike very much for coming on right. to have this discussion with me. Um, Mike. Yes. Tell us, uh, plug, make your plugs, okay? Because you've got a YouTube channel, you've got Lone Star, you know, like your own works and everything that I really encourage people to check out. So what what, what would you like to see? All right, well, uh, my channel, uh, I do mostly streaming. I do a lot of art streams. A lot. Of, I invite a lot of artists. We have a great competition stream every week called Drawn and Quartered. Uh, that's at Blacklist Universe on, on YouTube. Um, I have Mike Draws Comics as well, but that's kind of a side channel. And uh, yeah, I do. I again, I am obviously a comic book creator, and I've been doing Lone Star for about a couple of years now. I'm working on issue three. You can go to LoneStarComic.com and check those out. You can even get the first issue for free as a PDF uh, on the front page of of the Indiegogo campaign. So if you want to see what it's about, it is it is sort of my modern take on superheroism. Um, you know, they don't run around wearing spandex and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It, well, yeah, I mean, can I just say I personally love make, the spare decks. I was like, I, I, I do, too, I do too. But I feel like there's there's a modern sensibility that you've got a generation of people who grew up watching these very realistic movies where Captain America is not wearing spandex, right? He's wearing a uniform that that they modeled to have the similar color scheme, um, but it's like armor and all this. And so I was trying to get to a realistic place in my universe, Blacklist universe where if a character is jumping around in spandex, 
it's got to make sense. Mm -hmm. So, like, I have one character called Superhero G, who is the creation of a child's mind, right? Mm -hmm. So, because of that, obviously, he's going to be sporting spandex, because that's what a kid would think Mm -hmm. in that day and age. Um, But I'm just trying to approach re or or birthing a, a comic book universe from the sensibilities of the modern audience, not from, cause I love the eighties. I love spandex. I love all that stuff, but I'm trying to target today's yeah. newer audience, not just those guys. So my books have an eighties sensibility about storytelling, about craft, um, about quality, but visually uh, I need them to represent more of a modern context so that's lonestarcomic.com please do go check it out read that first issue if you like it think about supporting the other books i've got another project called monster hunt 2 i'm overseeing it it's written by i don't know if you're a fan of nexus mike baron he's uh mike baron steve rude one of the most famous independent comics of all time i'm crossing over with that and earthworm jim creator uh doug to naples bigfoot bill so it's lone star nexus bigfoot bill in this earth shatteringly awesome comic uh illustrated by industry phenom matthew weldon so that is also on indiegogo that's one of the awesome things about comic books like comic books have been now to do crossovers so much easier and quicker than any other kind of storytelling medium and Mm -hmm. there's great ones i know it's oftentimes they're just for fun they're not canon but sometimes they are and like seeing like aliens versus um spider-man i'm not sure if there was but i know there's like aliens versus yeah. some like comic book group and dude one just... of my favorite one of my favorite comics is across it's it's a uh, robotech uh versus terminator <laughs> not robotech uh, uh um robocop robocop uh, versus yeah, terminator. Yeah. oh it's fantastic <laughs> <laughs> but, sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you i'll keep, let you keep going oh that's all right yeah so um yeah, like you were saying that that doing those crossovers, this is so much fun because Mike Barron is like it, industry award winning, been writing comics as long as I've been reading comics, and he just took these this this core idea I sent him, and he turned it into this cacophony of madness, and it's it's just so exciting to see other people work on my characters, and yeah, crossovers so much fun, man. Um, by the way, the uh, the drawn and quartered. Pro, uh, book the that's the uh, the competition show we do every week. Mm-hmm. Uh, once the campaign for for Shadow of the Conqueror launches, we're going to do a Shadow of the Conqueror drawn and quartered. So we'll have probably eight or nine different artists all drawing. <sighs> probably Dalen. That's or, awesome, man. Yeah, so like, we'll do that. Maybe maybe we can uh, have you as on, on as guest oh, host if I'd you want to do that. I'd love it. That's see one of the other things, like as a, as a writer, right? Seeing people depict your world like is just the most awesome thing is like you know this is my character seeing real and even just fan art by the well by the way is just so satisfied where people have been engaging with the character so much in the scene drawing and then you know something like drawing quarter seeing all these other great artists that's like oh man that's awesome yeah so please everybody do subscribe to my channel at uh, blacklist universe awesome. that's great all right. Uh, thank you for joining us, Mike, and thank you everyone for watching. I hope you've enjoyed, and of course, I hope to see you in the next episode or video. Do I call them? I don't know. The next video of Shadowverse. So until then, bye.